So hello everyone. Uh, today is first day in our second European Academic Integrity Week, and with us we have ENI Academic Integrity Service Working Group that is going to present a talk about good teaching practices to promote academic integrity, and we are all really eager to hear what you have to say. So Inga, you are the boss of that, this working group and the floor is yours. Please introduce yourself. Uh, thank you. I am a boss with co-bosses. <laughs> uh, good morning, good afternoon or any other time, uh, everyone. Uh, and so let me start uh, sharing some slides which we have prepared. Um, so as Sonia already introduced uh, as we are today, wanted to pr present a seminar, Good Teaching Practices to Promote Academic Integrity. Uh, and we uh, are a team uh, representing INAI Academic Integrity Service Working Group. Uh, and I would like to ask each of uh, our presenters to shortly uh, introduce themselves. So uh, I am Inga Vizoskita from Lithuanian Center for Social Sciences. Uh, I'm also uh, the lead of the service working group and INI board member, uh, but also I have been doing uh, research on academic integrity for over five last uh, years. And also I have been teaching uh, for university students. My background is in sociology, so most of the subjects uh, have been related to that. Uh, Shiva? Uh, Shiva, you are mute, unmute yourself, please. Sorry. Uh, um, hi, I'm, I'm Shiva Das Sivis Brahmaniam. You can call me Shiva. I am the head of biomedical and forensic science at the University of Derby in UK. And I'm also a, a founder member of the European Network of Academic Integrity working in uh, different uh, working groups, uh, and I work closely with Inca and other partners in the integrity service working. Salim. Oh, thank you, Inga and Shiva. Uh, I'm Salim Raz from Chennai University, University of Turkey. I'm working at the Department of English Language Teaching and teaching academic writing there. And I'm also the founder director of the Center for Academic Integrity at my institution. I'm also a founder board member of uh, the European Network for Academic Integrity. Yes, please, Lorna. Hi, I'm Lorna Waddington. I'm from the University of Leeds. I'm a historian, but I am I have a um, fellowship researching academic integrity for one day a week. I'm also on the University of Leeds Academic Integrity Leadership Group, and I'm the university's representative at ENI. Um, Ali Reza. Hi, um, I'm Ali Reza Salinijad. I'm a researcher at the Faculty of Oldest Studies at University of Tehran, and I serve as the uh, Executive Secretary for a Committee on Ethics and Publications. I'm also a member of a COPE and serve on the uh, Ethics Committee of Linguistics Society of America. Uh, thank you. And, and we uh, also, Stella Maris Orin from Coventry University contributed to, to our webinar, but she's not here. I hope she might join us too. Um, later, so uh, what uh, we were wanted to suggest for uh, today's uh, webinar. So first we will shortly discuss the takeaway of the webinar, which means what we intended uh, for you to uh, bring after this webinar to your uh, own teaching uh, environments. Uh, we will start with the role of teaching for academic integrity. Uh, then we would like to introduce uh, academic integrity self-evaluation tools and specifically uh, self-evaluation tool for teachers. Uh, we will ask you to try out selected sections of this tool and in relation to discuss some uh, case examples. And finally, to have uh, a more common uh, discussion and sharing good uh, teaching practices that could be uh, uh, conducive for promoting uh, academic integrity in teaching and learning uh, environments. 
Uh, so uh, basically our webinar is constructed as a discussion and exchange with participants on what teaching practices can foster a culture of academic integrity in the learning environment. Um, and uh, we want to use uh, as a basis for that uh, academic integrity self-evaluation tool for teacher, which has been uh, developed as a, a project of ELI and our uh, academic integrity survey group is um, uh, developing uh, further. Uh, then we want to look at case example discussion and share uh, the good practices. Uh, so what we would like to start is the general picture. So uh, how academic integrity uh, works uh, is promoted or uh, is kept in learning uh, and teaching environment. Uh, so there are uh, many actors and other uh, environment related uh, factors that can, can influence that. Uh, so we have a lot of research on students. Uh, so uh, why students act with integrity or why they tend to cheat. Uh, we have already quite a lot of knowledge on the reasons uh, why students uh, tend to cheat. Uh, what might be the causes of uh, plagiarism? Uh, what can uh, foster them to get involved in uh, other types of uh, misconduct. Uh, also, we have, uh, as an important point, institutions uh, and their policies. So what is the role of institutional policies even promoting and uh, generating the culture of academic uh, integrity? Uh, also, we have uh, a lot of external environmental factors like uh, culture in a certain country or even uh, educational culture and actors such as parents and employers, for example, if academic integrity or uh, acting with academic integrity at the study period is somehow re relevant for employers, if, if there is a connection or continuation. Uh, and, and again, we have both discussions and research on that. However, today we wanted to look uh, at, we would say one uh, very important element uh, it's a teacher. So how can teaching practices shape learning environment in such a way that it promotes academic integrity? What we as a teachers can do uh, uh, to uh, encourage our students to study with integrity, uh, to follow uh, the, the shared values and principles uh, in their uh, studies. Uh, I don't know, maybe my colleagues would like to add something in this uh, common picture of how uh, academic integrity environment works. Uh, Inga, uh, if you don't mind, uh, I'd like to interrupt here regarding especially uh, changing approaches uh, to academic integrity policies. Uh, maybe we can uh, move forward the slides and uh, we will see that uh, we have mainly three approaches uh, to integrity policies, which are uh, didactive, reactive, and proactive approaches. And for the last 10 years, we see that uh, academic uh, integrity community is trying to uh, promote proactive policies rather than uh, merely detecting or showing reactions to academic misconduct. Uh, previously, uh, the research, relevant research, uh, mainly focused on the detection of academic misconduct and what kind of uh, sanctions should be delivered uh, for each of these academic misconducts. So that was the priority. And that's why in the, in the relevant literature, uh, we see that there are more studies dealing with academic misconduct compared to the promotion of academic uh, integrity. That's why uh, we, we recently have more pro, uh, proactive approaches. These are preventive approaches uh, highlighting uh, the importance of pedagogical approaches, the, uh, the importance of uh, teaching uh, how to avoid academic misconduct. For example, uh, it, it could be easy for teachers to detect plagiarism. However, 
uh, as writing features, for example, our priority uh, should not be focusing on the direction of plagiarism. Instead, uh, we should uh, we should find ways of uh, how to avoid plagiarism occurring in our classes. Therefore, uh, we will need uh, we will need to benefit from uh, pedagogies. Uh, so. Uh, this, uh, this will help us better for the promotion of academic integrity. Well, and to continue with it, I would like to ask to Lorna to comment shortly about this uh, positive uh, academic integrity strategies, which again is our focus in today's uh, webinar. So at Leeds, um, part of the research fellowship we put forward was this, these sort of like three strand strategies. And what we've been focusing on this year is very much the positive, how to develop a positive environment, both in the seminars, in the faculty, in the university as a whole. As part of this, we actually um, undertook a student survey just to find, find out what our students at Leeds know about academic integrity. And there were some really quite surprising findings from this survey. Students seem actually reluctant to discuss academic integrity with their module tutors, but they were very happy to discuss academic integrity with their academic personal tutors. And when we talked about this with students, they felt it was a bit more of a safer space. Also as part of this project, we've started to recruit paid student ambassadors or academic integrity champions. And it's very important, it's something that we're really stressing at Leeds, that it's not just the academics, it's the academics, it's the students. We work very closely with the student union. And I'm finding the student perspective very, very valuable. For example, our current student who is paid, you know, is paid a hourly rate, talking about using influencers and we know that SAMLs use influencers, but our students want to use their influencers. And, you know, these, these have like 10,000 plus followers. So it's back to the positive. The, the, the working group that we work with the students are all very keen to ensure that the sort of like the academic integrity of the degree schemes throughout the university and throughout the UK um, HE institutions are maintained. The students are as, are as invested in this as we are and I think that's really important to continue to work in a positive way. It's not just about the punitive, pre preventative is something different. Um, we've also been talking about things like honour codes. So that's something that I'm working with UK institutions, um, other academics, about students, ambassadors for academic integrity network. So it'll be interesting to see what comes out of that. But it's really about the positive rather than just the people. So on to slide eight. I'm not sure who's next. Yeah. Uh, and, and so uh, we thought. Uh, that not we thought, <laughs> but uh, it, it is uh, common that if, if we want to uh, change uh, our outlook on uh, how we teach, uh, on how we communicate uh, with students, uh, on what kind of strategies uh, uh, in talking to students about academic integrity we can apply, uh, one of the important things is uh, kind of monitoring, regular monitoring, uh, and for that we might need tools. Um, and this uh, academic in, in European Network of Academic Integrity uh, working group developed uh, a set of academic integrity self-evaluation tools, uh, and they are designed as uh, online questionnaires uh, uh, where one can explore the status of academic integrity, both at institutional levels and uh, by individual members of uh, education community. And we have this uh, overall, we have four uh, of such tools. So one tool is um, uh, directed to students, one is for teachers. We also have a tool for researchers and institutions. Um, and as I said, the tools are basically aimed at kind of self-monitoring, self-evaluation, self-reflection. Uh, and the, each tool is composed in uh, the same way. So it has an introduction, it has uh, several sections, 
uh, each section has uh, a, set, a set of questions. So when you answer the questions uh, inside, there is a score for each question. Uh, and at the end of each section, you receive a feedback based on your answers. And the feedback is not uh, something that actually somehow assesses you, but more as a guidance, uh, what uh, practices could be uh, changed or might provide you some hints uh, how, uh, for example, your uh, some pedagogical strategies could be uh, shaped, in, shaped in a different way. And of course, we have kind of a small overall feedback at the end of uh, each tool. Uh, so now I will uh, uh, focus a little bit more on uh, academic integrity self-evaluation tool uh, for teachers. Uh, so this tool, uh, our aim was that <clears throat> this tool provides an opportunity for teachers to reflect upon their uh, approach and teaching practices and receive some guidance for further development. Uh, so this uh, academic integrity self-evaluation tool for teachers uh, has uh, five sections. Uh, approach to teaching and student motivation, interaction with students and guidance about integrity, awareness of institutional policies, dealing with student dishonesty, and knowledge and skills about plagiarism and academic, and academic writing. Uh, some parts of this tool, uh, they also correspond to the parts uh, of academic integrity self-evaluation tool for teachers, uh, because we saw uh, that when developing the tools that uh, this part are uh, very important for both students and uh, teachers to uh, have a common understanding, uh, but other parts are uh, specifically directed to uh, to the teachers. Uh, and uh, so uh, today we would like uh, to invite you to, to try out uh, this self-evolution tools. Uh, and let me now go to, uh, I'm sorry, I have to go back to, I will, to chat and uh, send you a link. Uh, so now uh, in the chat, uh, Sonia, do you think participants now see my link or should I put it in another chat? I stopped sharing now for, for a, a moment because... I've tried to post the link in the chat to everybody, so can people see it now? Uh -huh. Yeah, so I see that the people are seeing now, yes, okay, because I probably put it in the wrong place. <clears throat> yeah, so now I am going back to the slides. Um, So we will see how many, so we originally planned that we will uh, try out uh, two first sections, but uh, we'll see uh, by the time. Uh, so if you now uh, opened uh, the tool uh, via link, so first you will see introduction. Uh, <clears throat> it basically represents what I already thought about the tool, uh, who created it, what are the aims. Uh, so after shortly reading it, you can uh, push continue. Then you will see demography uh, section. You do not have to fill it in. You are not obliged to do it. So you can uh, simply uh, push next and you will go to the first section of uh, self-evaluation tool. Uh, so please uh, do it uh, and my, Colleagues, please follow the chat if there are some issues. So please announce to me so that uh, uh, we can uh, solve them. And then if everyone went to section one, so simply it's the my approach to teaching and student motivation. 
So uh, answer the questions. After you will push next, you will uh, get to the feedback. Please read the feedback and then please join us back and we will uh, have some uh, discussion uh, via chat uh, about uh, th this section and uh, some case examples that uh, go with this section. So we will look at the chat uh, when people are coming back after filling in the first section. If some new participants uh, would like to start uh, trying out uh, self-evaluation tool. So I just remind that uh, in the demography section, you are not obliged to fill in any information. You simply can push next and, and go straight to the, to the questions because we are just trying out. It's, um, so we make it a bit more simple. Okay, so I saw that some participants already finished, so uh, let us know others if, if you are ready to move uh, with the discussion, at least a couple more who are done so that we know. Okay, so let's assume that majority is done or reading through the feedback. So we uh, now would like to open uh, a small discussion and uh, feedback both on the tool and uh, the uh, idea that section uh, itself uh, uh, communicates. And so I invite both the participants and, and the panelists uh, uh, to first discuss it. So. Uh, as, as you could see, uh, the first section of the tool basically uh, highlights that the idea that uh, uh, when the teacher uh, puts effort motivating the students, explaining them uh, uh, what they are expecting uh, with the course, how the course is placed in uh, some wider uh, study process in, in general, and also uh, the method that uh, a teacher chooses may uh, be more or sometimes less conducive for uh, academic integrity in, 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 in the classroom. Uh, and so we would like to uh, ask our participants for, for some reflections. What were your thoughts uh, after you received uh, the feedback? And maybe what are your uh, good practices uh, in this initial communicating with the students and also how you uh, set up your uh, courses or modules uh, for teaching. Uh, also, the panelists can join and, and, and tell your, uh, your uh, experiences here. It would be really great to get some uh, feedback from participants, but I don't see it yet. So maybe some panelists would say their good experiences of how you communicate your uh, uh, courses to students and what maybe are the ways that you found are uh, more efficient than the others. Mm -hmm. 
I, I would just say, Inga, that on for the for this first question about how you communicate the approach to coursework, I also discuss academic integrity as well at this point in time. So I discuss why the why the assignment is important, the transferable skills that they will be gaining, but also we have a brief discussion about, you know, sort of like problems maybe associated with collusion or using CHEG or, or something similar. I do think it starts right from the beginning with the with the first interactions with the students about the assessments because the assessments matter so much to them. Okay, thank you, Lorna. Uh, Sally Morshiva. Yeah, on, on my, my part, I think we need that, that feedback from the, uh, the lecturers and, and the teachers. Uh, but, but, but the problem is we also need to, uh, that's a, that I'm going to follow that up with my next slides or whatever. We also need to think about the way in which we can minimize giving the chances of the students uh, to plagiarize. Uh, I, will, I will elaborate that in my, in my section, yeah. Okay, uh, so, so far, uh, I don't see much comments and uh, thank you and yes, uh, yeah, and, and there is a comment that I never realized how important introducing the purpose of the course may actually be. Um, uh, yeah, and, and also that I quite often have my students uh, uh, many students and it's problematic to give feedback uh, in the quality and, and quantity. So uh, yes, this is uh, probably a usual problem that when we have uh, smaller uh, groups, it's easier to, uh, to have this communication. And we have, when, when we have bigger groups, it, it's uh, uh, not so easy. Uh, however, we might also uh, get develop varied uh, strategies how to uh, how to deal with it. Um, so one of the things that I myself do, uh, of course, I don't have like hundreds of students at one point, but sometimes it is about uh, eight, 80 students uh, and so on. So uh, what at least I have developed that it's very important to have this clear uh, information uh, about your course. Uh, about the requirements, uh, also uh, about schedules, uh, and also descriptions of the tasks. Uh, so prepared in advance and uh, kept in one place that is always available for the students. So I find out that it's in particular with big uh, groups, it is uh, really uh, essential to have such a course environment uh, where students at any point having any uh, questions could go and find answers to those questions so that you, you are not uh, overwhelmed uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with questions for, from students uh, all, all the time, but you kind of foresee the questions that can come from, from the students and you in advance have these uh, answers put like, for example, in a Moodle environment of your course. Uh, so at least for me, it was something that uh, worked quite quite well. Uh, and yes, and there is a question: uh, What can you do with unmotivated uh, students? Um, and I see Alreza has some uh, comment as well. Please. Uh, yes, that's a very relevant question. What you want to do with uh, students who are not very motivated? Uh, first of all, you have to set the purpose for pursuing an academic degree, whether you are dealing with undergraduate students or postgraduate students. Uh, I believe it would be a very different strategy when you are uh, telling a student at undergraduate level to uh, follow certain instructions to avoid misconduct than a person who is a PhD candidate. Uh, I believe that PhD students and PhD candidates uh, naturally intend to pursue careers in science and academia and perhaps uh, in within the culture of publish or perish and of course for their uh, raising promotions in academia they need to be familiar with these things 
one common issue is that uh, most universities, at least in, in my country, right, they do not provide uh, any training for lecturers and supervisors on how to supervise the students, uh, which leads to many students are unsupervised in this regard. And even there, um, I've seen many cases that, uh, particularly in master cases and even PhD students, they haven't received uh, appropriate supervision regarding their uh, dissertations. So they have to go on their own and uh, write something up. And finally, you know, just uh, the supervisor and advisors just want their articles published and their name put there. That's it. So when it comes to motivating such as students, perhaps uh, they, they have to establish that what they're looking for. Uh, naturally in academia, many people want to publish articles and papers. So following such instructions, uh, in my opinion, would lead to better publications and more publications in more prestigious journals, which they have to follow. And Shiva? Yes, just to um, give some uh, yes, my Shiva. thought. Is it me or is it? Yeah, just mm -hmm. to give some uh, my, some of my thoughts on what uh, uh, Ali, Ali Reza has said is that you know, I think this is an issue for, especially in the countries where there is a urge for scientific research, but that is not matched with the the proper training uh, on the ethics side and the uh, the uh, academic integrity side. And that is something probably, you know, the we as a European network of academic integrity, we need to look into that. And then the Salim is there, who would be your who would be your nearest uh, uh, point of contact, Al Reza, and then probably we can take it forward and working together to achieve that kind of training. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So, okay, we need to move a little bit forward. Uh, however, from the chat, we can conclude, and 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 our participants also agree that this introduction and uh, explaining about the the course uh, and the requirements and what we expect from the students is uh, really important uh, probably does not solve the whole problem of unmotivated students but uh, it is a very important uh, point uh, at the beginning of your course and probably throughout the course uh, to keep the the students uh, involved uh, I will probably share my other uh, reflection on, on motivating students that might not be motivated or lowly motivated, but a bit maybe later, because the, the first section also touched upon um, uh, some uh, teaching uh, strategies, approach, strategy approaches, and, and here we have a case related case example uh, from Shiva. So. Uh, you can look at it and, and Shiva may uh, comment a little bit. Yeah, so let me first of all uh, put the, the case. This is actually a case study I call them. This is actually happened, uh, but I just uh, anonymized uh, for the sake of uh, discussing this. So let's see some person I just give a name, uh, Simon, Dr. Simon. He's a lecturer in a university within Europe. And uh, normally many universities, they do a registry the audit for uh, everything. So once they did, uh, they did, they found out that in in particularly in his module, Simon's module, that the percentage of student plagiarism for the past five years are always never went down, is always on the uh, rise rather than decreasing it. So everybody was worried about, okay, what are the problem with the students? But some of us, who came to know this, we thought about what is the problem on the lecturer side? Because how come the other students, are in, the students in the same cohort of students in the other modules, there's no high percentage, but only in this particular lecture, there's a high percentage of uh, um, student plagiarism or plagiaristic behavior. So anybody, if you want to give a, your thoughts on that, probably what, I mean, just, yes, we are always focused on the student side of the story, but we fail to focus on the lecturer side of the story because, as I told you in my discussion, that 
we try to minimize, we need to minimize the chances of students plagiarizing. That is our duty. So anybody wanted to write anything on, on Simon's case, whether he had done anything wrong, I can tell you what he has done. Uh, but I thought this is a thought provoking process. So let's hear from you guys. Everybody's silent. Yeah, I don't see any comments, but I can uh, can say my experience that like, I don't know, over 10 years ago when I started teaching, one of first shocks was when I collected the my first uh, semester uh, because I took over the course of another lecturer and I collected uh, papers from, <laughs> from students. I realized how many issues there are in those papers. Uh, not specifically like plagiarism because it's it, it's a serious word to say, but th they had a lot of issues related to academic integrity, and 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 that was the thought was so what do I do now? And one of the things, so of course I, I solved these situations there and, and with the students, but for 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 the future, uh, question for myself was so uh, what can I do uh, to avoid such situation next semester uh, because for me as for teacher uh, I really do not want to deal with the outcome <laughs> so I thought what can I do to avoid that type of the outcome uh, so basically I started to uh, restructure restructuring my assignments uh, uh, I started to like making them smaller uh, I started to distributing them across the semester. Uh, uh, I started this, at, even if it's minimal but constant monitoring. Uh, so this is this might be an answer for some who are looking how to motivate students. It might be a bit annoying, but I uh, uh, realized that it helps students uh, to motivate themselves. Uh, so, for example, if I'm giving them uh, a, a written assignment, uh, I give a period, for example, so it's like two months uh, to complete this written assignment. And basically, throughout those two months, uh, every week, uh, at the end of every week's class, I leave five minutes where I ask them, so how is your progress with this written task? Uh, do you have any questions? Uh, do you need any help? Uh, is there something you would like to discuss? So usually the first two or three weeks, there are very few questions or no questions at all, but then they start. Uh, and the effect of this is that students feel they are monitored. Uh, they feel that this is important. Uh, they know that this is something they have to do and someone is monitoring that they do it. Uh, and actually at the end, usually at the end of semester, they say that this is a very good strategy because it makes them think about the task and, and, and do the task and clarify the things and, and the quality of the works. I'm usually quite satisfied with most, most time of, of the whole of the group. So at least this, and I think that yes, if there is one uh, lecturer with high plagiarism uh, rates, there is something probably also not only in the student, but also in the way the tasks are structured. Uh -huh. And Lorna is raising her hand. I was going to say, I do something very similar for like a final year project for the dissertation. So I have the students fill out a weekly log, um, you know, like online on our VLE. And it talks about main findings of that week or key books, key articles that they've read. And then periodically, when the subject comes up during the tutorial, I'll ask students to give like a five minute presentation on the research that they've done so far. And I agree with you. I think that commitment that they have to show because the, the dissertations are over the whole academic year. And it means that I actually know what they're doing. I know how they're progressing. I can see if they may be struggling. I get them to fill out toggle timer to say how long they've spent on the dissertation each week. And they and I can monitor if they're falling slightly behind so that I can help them catch up rather than it gets to sort of the deadline day and they're having to take other methods to try and make it up. So I agree with you, Inger. I think that sort of the engagement between the tutor and the students throughout the semester, not just at the deadline, is really important. 
Uh, thank you. And I don't see, uh, okay, now some comment. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes, of, yes. It, 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 so the comment is, is it possible to assert that consistent and proper feedback is an, an important part of academic integrity? I would say definitely yes. Yeah. Uh, of course, I will add like very shortly that this is not an easy thing. And we come back to those, for example, who works with hundreds of students. Uh, however, I think that even finding like a minimal regular feedback, even if it goes to the to the whole group or in one sentences for each student, usually this is something that uh, works even in, in at that level. But of course, like proper, more extensive uh, feedback for students is is is. Yeah, I would say a very important part of academic integrity. Yes, Shiva, and, and your comment, and then you reveal what's, what was oh, wrong. Yeah. With the so my comment, <laughs> the, my comment on this is, 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 I mean, exactly, Inca more or less read my mind, but, you know, the, the, it is the, I call it continuous feedback-led assessment, which is fantastically, work fantastically well with this with the cohorts of stu uh, students with 30 or 40 students but especially in in my field medical bi biomedical field we got 400 students that might be a difficult process although it is a, a fantastic process to make sure that they minimize uh prejudice no matter it might be difficult to give uh, a continuous feedback or continuous touching point for all the students uh, if, if the cohort is size is high. But the alternate for that is like Inka suggested, probably we can uh, meet them as a cohort and then get examples and then explain it. So there are ways for it. But in this particular case, I, I'm going to reveal the problem. The problem is Simon has been uh, more or less, can, can you press the next uh, button please? Simon, Simon has been more or less uh, recycling his questions for the past five years, again and again, same questions. Even the parts of the questions are same. And you know now there are websites, uh, even uh, Facebook pages where students communicate with each other. So some, some of the past students have already uploaded the, the, uh, their answers with the higher mark and a lower mark and a range of marks for them. And the students are more or less, yeah, if what goes around comes around. If you get, recycle your question, then the students will recycle the answer. Simple and straightforward. So, you know, Simon has been asked to, you know, retrain himself about his, um, uh, what do you call, assessment strategy, so on and so forth. And then this might happen to us as well sometimes we got carried away and with our work, other, other research, and sometimes we might, might not focus on the assessment strategy and then try to repeat the same thing again and again and again. And that itself giving a, a, a chance for the students or giving an opportunity for the students to plagiarize. So please remember that there is life outside the academia, that there, there the students socially interact with them and they know oh yeah this lecture lecturer will always ask this question and this is the answer so let's go for the next one <laughs> so this is actually probably uh, almost all of you are probably experienced this that but i just uh, summarized it so it's another university that the postgraduate students uh, are expected to submit an article for each module at the end of the semester um, in addition of final exam. Uh, although this would depend on the subject of the course. Uh, so I, I think this is um, more or less from the social sciences and humanities. So again, 15 to 20 pages long constitute 40% of the final grade. Whereas in practice, these manuscripts are scarcely ever published the exception is that the articles should be publishable and have the appropriate method, met, methods. So overall, the postgraduate student usually may submit six to eight articles annually. What is the problem of expecting students, or I call it over-assessing students? 
with uh, asking them to write six to seven articles around 15 to 20 pages each. That is true for some time in medical sciences as well. So the, the, we are creating students to work hard, that's fine, but six to eight articles at the end of the day, none of them are going to be published either. So what is the point of asking them to write six to eight articles per year? Is, 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 there, some, is, is there something there more or less indirectly urge them to plagiarize. And also, Shiva, when we look at, at research, where we look for reasons why students uh, plagiarize, why they get involved in contract cheating, uh, why they get involved in other cheating practices, we always see there like this, uh, apart from other reasons, these kind of feelings of over being overwhelmed uh, not having enough skills to produce uh, these big amounts of uh, text and, and so on and so on. So basically we know, uh, in a sense, I would say that we know that this, these things will happen, uh, but still we, we construct uh, these kinds of work or these amounts of work instead of focusing maybe on quality, uh, like one paper, but with the quality and with a lot of work on it, or combining the same paper for several classes uh, and, and gaining value in that uh, and so on. So again, it's uh, it, we come back a lot from the student to the teaching practices, to our uh, learning environment setups and so on. Yeah. Yeah, and then, you know, as, as somebody suggested that it, it, it's overload, work overload, I mean, one of the things I always insist for my students is they've got three different lives. One is the academic life, the other one is the social life, and the other one is the family life. And if you overdo the academic life or anything else, then the balance is lost and they will be pushed to the corner. They don't have time to write anything. So what they will do is they try to cut and paste it or try to manipulate it. So actually, somebody has highlighted that. The other mm -hmm. one is uh, we could look into more. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. the other comment is integrative assessments, which I, I just mentioned. I think, yes, this is one of uh, very important things to consider when instead of many separate big papers, we could collaborate and, uh, and ask students to do uh, one or two papers uh, from different subjects because Often, I mean, we are still the study in the same broader field. So uh, things are connected. And then uh, writing one better integrative uh, paper would be value both in terms of assessment, student work, and of course, the, 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 the learning of the students. And I saw others also raised uh, the hands, so short comment, and then we move on. <laughs> yeah, the three chief issues year is first of all the unrealistic expectations i mean uh, generally speaking early and mid-career faculty members themselves in social science and humanities they do not uh, write or publish uh, even six articles annually so expecting uh, graduate students write to as many papers is of course a waste of time um, and of course uh, many of these people are not uh, familiar with the fundamentals and the basic form of research whether we are talking about the uh, uh, systematic uh, data gathering to uh, data management and even appropriate referencing and another one is inadequacy of the supervised research as it was mentioned and that's uh, well not only that the lecturers should provide feedback throughout the course but also they should actually supervise appropriate methodology and theoretical framework, uh, which is a common issue that sometimes uh, some of the supervisors, they are not even familiar with such uh, frameworks. I mean, they're like the students, they expect the students to do the job and they just uh, read the paper after it's finished. And another more dangerous issue is the cultivating the culture of poor research. If as a graduate student, you continue writing uh, such poor papers and just get away with it. Unfortunately, soon enough, you will become a researcher yourself or a faculty member yourself, and you will continue this culture. 
And that's another problem, in my opinion. Thank you. Okay, so. Uh, yeah, this is the, the, I think probably this is the last case study example from us. Yes. Uh, yeah, so this another university has reported an increase in suspected plagiarism in the post pandemic online assessment. Probably many of us have reported that students were only issued warning but so what they did was there are so many potential potentially suspected plagiarism but in the end after the investigation wasting several uh, staff's time and everything the students were only issued with the unacceptable academic practices penalty not without any penalties so again my question is what might have contributed to this decision probably yeah, if we've got time, we can discuss it, or, or otherwise, I will give the answer anyway. Okay, let's see if our participants have any idea about yeah. it. If not, then you reveal <laughs> the intrigue. And I think this this might have been common to in in in, in many cases. And then in, just in, for for the sake of all the all the participants, because we don't know from which country they are joining so in in uk and uh, many of the european countries that there are two types of penalties one is the unacceptable academic practices which is is actually not a penalty it's a slap in the wrist don't do it again naughty boy and then that's it the other one is a real penalty so but when you investigate a plagiarism uh, quite a lot of time is wasted staff time is wasted on investigating and trying to prove. So here, they wasted all the time and in the end they couldn't prove anything uh, because there are some, what you call, gray areas produced by the academics actually. We are more, more or less discussing the academic contribution for student plagiarizing. Yeah, that, that's that's a good question. We need to worry about the prevention rather than uh, what I call penalties. But here, the, the problem is that something to do with the, the post-pandemic and the, the way the assessment has been carried out. Uh, so that's what, I mean, I can reveal that, you know, the assessment has been online and this is uh, uh, something related to my area, medical, uh, area medical area has got a variety of way of making students follow the academic integrity because you can ask a clinical based question where there's minimum chances of cutting and pasting despite that that particular university they use the normal theory based question and then they put a note in the exam questions saying that you can use Google searches as long as you can reference it. So what they did is this, what the student did was they cut and pasted it, gave the reference, put it in the quotation mark. That's it. So they haven't actually plagiarized. They have, have they learned anything? No. Is, the, is this a good academic practice? No. But we cannot prove that they have plagiarized. So again, the academics made a big mistake. Again, it's not, I won't say it's a mistake. We are not prepared as academics for pandemic. This is true. This never happened in my university, but it's somewhere, somewhere else I heard. But even in our university, we were, we were not pre pre prepared for the pandemic. We are more or less taking reflective actions for everything. And one of them it resulted in this kind of activity in some uh, university. And the other extreme is, e-proctoring. I'm not going to go into there because that is beyond the scope of this uh, workshop. Uh, I think we can uh, move to the next section and this comes back to uh, Lorna's comment a little bit uh, later that she uh, involves academic integrity. So uh, the section is my interactions with students and guidance about integrity. So now again, uh, up to five minutes to uh, fill in section two, read through the feedback and come back uh, for the discussion.
So I hope uh, those of you who are still filling in or reading the feedback are finishing. Could I receive like one or two more confirmations that you are done so that we move on? Okay, so from the comments, I see that we probably can uh, come back. And, and as you could see, the, the section uh, focuses quite a lot on, so how do we, again, as the teachers communicate to our students about integrity? And again, what, what kind, of, uh, kind of safeguards do we put or do we not <laughs> uh, in our uh, teaching? Uh, again, to help them uh, avoid misconduct or simply to learn uh, skills uh, needed for that. And I see the comment that we may, we may take for granted that students know how to avoid plagiarism naturally just because we know. Uh, and I would uh, probably agree with this and, and, and again uh, start uh, our discussion by uh, sharing my experience that uh, uh, Academic integrity is something that we sometimes do not, uh, I will follow the, the, the comment of participant, naturally uh, connect to our uh, subject matter that we teach. And as, as the comment says, so we expect that students who come to us to learn certain subject matter, they already know uh, academic writing. Uh, they have the skills, uh, they know about academic integrity. And again, uh, both our experiences, uh, experience and, and quite many research show that it's not the case. Uh, so we can say that students who leave high school usually do not have the skills which we require from them at the university level. Usually uh, at the first year at the university, not in all countries, not in all universities, students receive extensive enough academic integrity or academic writing or related training, uh, which means that we might expect from them something that they do not naturally have. <laughs> uh, and, and, and then the question is, so how do we solve it? Um, so my experience was that at some point I realized that, uh, again, if I want uh, to avoid student misconduct in any form, uh, I must integrate uh, academic integrity topic into my subject matter. It means that I have to uh, take, in a sense, take away, but I don't think it's taking away time from my subject matter and to put questions uh, related to academic integrity there. So for example, uh, during the first meeting, I spent part of the time uh, explaining about the requirements for my course uh, tasks. Yeah, reminding about academic uh, writing uh, things. Uh, the same I do, again, every step uh, the students uh, are making. So whenever I have a task which requires certain skills, I ask them if they do have those skills. Uh, and also, the, even when they say that they, they do have them, it's not always so. So I repeat those things, I check those things, uh, and, and then I can expect uh, that they will deliver and they work with integrity. Uh, without this kind of uh, involvement of in academic integrity into your subject matter, I think that this expectation might not be well uh, granted. Uh, would colleagues like to add here? I think Lorna had similar uh, position in the very beginning of our webinar. Yeah, I, I'd also say as well that it's not just enough to say it at the start of the module. It's, it's a message that you need to keep on repeating throughout the module and throughout each level of the degree as well. The, the more times a student hears it, the, you know, the, the better it is. I, I would also say it's important to, to repeat the discussions when key assessments are due as well. So it's a continuous process. It's not level one, semester one student, you have the discussion and then that's it. You do need to continue with the discussions. Uh. Okay. Uh, Salim, are you here? Because we next have some case examples from you. So. Yeah, yes, Ingo, I'm here. 
Indeed, okay. I'm experiencing a technical problem. My battery died for my laptop. Mm -hmm. I'm on my mobile here, and I'll, I'm joining you from my mobile. Okay, so I'm turning on now uh, some of the, the, our last case example, but with a very extensive experience from Salim, because this is one thing that many of us encounter, and I think it's very good. So please. Uh, I followed uh, the discussions from the chat box as well, and I saw that uh, feedback is, is uh, a concern of many of us when we are teaching. And uh, I believe uh, the example, the case here, uh, will provide some basis uh, for uh, peer feedback exchange here. Okay, let's read the question. What do you think about the implementation of text matching software in a syllabus? And here, uh, to understand this, I will ask you kindly check the following figure and question the reasons for changes with the numbers. Now, uh, if you are teaching, I will uh, simply ask you, uh, do you benefit from text matching software when you receive submissions from your students? That is the first question. And uh, if you are doing so, what do you think about its possible uh, implication in your classes? So that's, that's the general question. Uh, Inga, shall we give some time to the mm -hmm. audience to think about it or shall we move forward? What do you think? Uh, maybe let's move forward and if we have some questions, then we okay. answer. Okay. So for now, I don't see any. So I put next slide, all right? Okay, yes, please. Okay, then. Uh, I am listing plagiarism in incidents in my academic writing classes here, uh, I believe this provides good evidence for the implementation of text matching software. Indeed, I've been teaching uh, academic writing for, for about 15 years. And uh, in 2010, I start teaching whether my students were plagiarizing. It was at that time. At that time, uh, I was not using text machine software in order to receive submissions. And when I had suspects, uh, I checked it on Google and revealed that uh, out of 167 students, 100 of them were plagiarizing. So it's uh, more than two thirds of my students. So it was a shocking experience for me. Uh, which uh, require some action. Okay, it means that uh, I was doing something something wrong. So for next year, uh, I uh, realize that but our university start uh, using Turnitin. So uh, for next year, I ask my students to submit their assignments through Turnitin. As you see uh, from the figures, uh, uh, the numbers of uh, students who plagiarize next year decreased. So what do we learn here? Okay, uh, when you implement text matching software in your classes, it will help you prevent plagiarism to some extent, but uh, it doesn't solve the problem uh, indeed. Why not? Because as you see in the middle, uh, the dark uh, blue one, the, the dark blue figure, uh, the number of students who did not submit their assignments, uh, it's almost tripled, more, more than doubled. So what does it mean? Students who had the fear that they will be caught uh, by turning uh, if they submit plagiarized assignments, they decided not to submit their assignments. But as a teacher, it was not something uh, that I desire because uh, I'm there to teach. Uh, I, I'm not there for policing to detect plagiarizer. I'm, I'm there to teach. Therefore, uh, I thought about what to do uh, in order to, it was one of the other concerns of our participants today, in order to, do, to motivate students to write their assignments, to submit their assignments. So it means that if we simply focus on detective policies or reactive policies, it means that uh, we will be discouraging some students. Therefore, uh, in my, I, I developed a model, anonymous multimediated writing uh, model. Maybe we can see it in the uh, following figure. Inga, 
uh, in the next one, please. Okay, here, here we see the figure. So in this figure, students uh, exchange peer feedback. However, they do not do this in a traditional manner because uh, once you ask your students to exchange peer feedback and once you match them uh, against each other, one by one, I mean, uh, this might be problematic. There will be some students who will be misleading each other. There will be some students who are reluctant to criticize their friends. So in my model, what I did was uh, they delivered feedback anonymously. So it was uh, they neither know the name of the authors nor the reviewers. So indeed, I was uh, giving the priority to keep the anonymity of the reviewer students there because uh, so, so that they wouldn't uh, uh, be under the impact of any social uh, discrimination there because of the criticism. And uh, another uh, important point here, in the traditional matching uh, methodology, uh, once you match a good student with a poor student, uh, the poor student uh, will have almost no contribution to the development of good student. So uh, it, is, it is not a good matching uh, technique. So what I did in my model was, uh, I matched every student paper with three students. Ideally, one student that I identify as good at writing, one as poor at writing, and one in the middle. So it means that every student will be receiving feedback from three other peers. And the feedback uh, that the student receives uh, will, will be coming from students that are at different proficiency levels. So there might be some contradiction um, if, with the feedback that, that students are receiving. It's quite similar to what happens when we submit a paper to a journal. You will be receiving feedback not only from reviewer A, but don't, don't uh, forget about reviewer B. So there will be some reviewer uh, Bs there. Uh, therefore, uh, it, it will be students' responsibility, the student author responsibility uh, to check the accuracy of the feedback and then to act accordingly. It doesn't necessarily mean that, okay, hey teacher, I received this feedback, so I change it. Maybe the feedback that you received uh, was not qualified and was misleading. So it gives the student order another responsibility to check the accuracy of the feedback, in a way contributing to the development of metacognitive skills. On the other hand, it also provides another opportunity for reviewer students, because uh, from the relevant literature, we learned that uh, reviewing uh, papers, peer papers, also contribute to the development of academic writing skills. Uh, therefore, it is, it is also uh, another contribution. And another important issue here, we also talk about in this session, assessment procedures. Now, my students spent some time. Shiva, you said that uh, they have lives, uh, three different lives. Yes, you are right. And I ask my students to, to spend some of their time to deliver feedback to their peers. What does it mean? It means that if they are spending some time, I need to appreciate their efforts. How do I do this? Okay, you are writing your paper. Your paper, uh, the submitted paper, will contribute to your final exam score. Whereas the feedback that you provide will contribute to your midterm exam scores. And at the end of the semester, by considering the quality of the feedback that they provided to their peers, I score their feedback quality in addition to scoring their papers. So I am appreciating their efforts by, uh, both in writing the paper and scoring the paper. And when it comes to asking them to deliver feedback, I give them my rubric and they provide feedback by using the rubric that I use when I score their papers. So uh, in terms of both teaching and uh, testing, uh, it provides a good opportunity. And uh, I've been using this model for, for about 10 years and it, it works properly uh, with my students. 
thank you, Salim. So this is one more example. So how we can uh, try to change our uh, strategy as teacher and and to uh, get uh, not one hundred of <laughs> papers that contain uh, more or less plagiarized. Uh, Okay, so we are really moving. We had, I think, good discussions, and we are really moving towards the end of our webinar. And maybe we'll have like final remarks. But before that, <clears throat> what I would like to uh, to show. So some of you asked in, in the chat. So if the tools are available, uh, so yes, uh, all four tools are uh, freely available on Inai uh, uh, website. And uh, as you can see, the link is. Uh, and the same when you go to academicintegrity.eu survey, uh, you will see all four uh, service uh, or uh, self-evaluation tools there. And you can use them for, uh, suggest them for students for self-evaluation. You can, of course, we invite you all to finish uh, the whole tool, uh, not only the first two sections, and also we have tool for researchers and uh, institutions. And, and this is, uh, uh, we assume this is a very good uh, way to have this uh, self-reflection of uh, ourselves in a, a certain uh, role that um, these tools uh, cover. Okay, so, and if you look for uh, more information, you can always uh, look at uh, not only the tools, but also at our uh, working group uh, uh, site or uh, contact us. Uh, and now we have uh, like literally five minutes, so I would like to have like a, a last comment from each of the panelists, very short one, uh, and maybe some uh, comments uh, on the webinar from uh, our participants. So who would like to, to start? I don't know, maybe Shiva. <laughs> so what's the message you want to give to all the participants uh, before leaving? My message is short. I mean, that's the message I, I, I was uh, telling at the beginning that, you know, we as an ac academic has the duty uh, to remove any chances of students plagiarizing or minimizing the chances of students plagiarizing. And this is this can only be achieved by collaborative working and then effective assessment. So that is that is my message. Thank you, Shiva. Uh, Lorna? Well, I'd echo Shiva's thoughts, of course, but also to engage in the process with the students right at the start of their academic career and continue to engage with them and not be not be afraid to have the discussions with them about the importance of academic integrity and also things like essay mills. Um, we, we need to discuss this with students and continue discussing these discussions. Uh, Salim? Um, uh, I had my academic integrity policies PhD course uh, yesterday, and I see that two of my PhD students are here joining this session. And yesterday, um, some of my students uh, uh, were not that motivated after the class because uh, they told me that, hey, teacher, you are living in an utopia. So we will, we will never uh, achieve these goals. However, uh, they are here and they see that we are experiencing uh, similar problems at different parts of the world. And as academics, as responsible academics, we come together and uh, we, we have the unity here uh, to, to show the others that, hey, uh, we are aware of the problems and we are doing our best to prevent the problems. So I'd like to motivate, uh, increase all my students and uh, the others as well, motivation uh, to deal with, uh, with the promotion of academic integrity. And uh, these survey tools will give us really uh, good information about the situation at our institutions or at, at some other institutions. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Salim. Alireza? Uh, it's very important to distinguish between different forms of research misconduct and plagiarism. Uh, using a software, as time suggested, is very important, uh, practical, 
um, it's a combat plagiarism, but we have to note that uh, perhaps recycling cannot be detected using a plagiarism detection software. And most importantly, different sorts of uh, data misconduct, such as data replication, data duplication, and data fabrication, they cannot be detected using a software. So perhaps it's important that, first of all, we distinguish between different forms of uh, plagiarism and misconduct. We teach uh, these different forms to students, and most importantly, yet again, we also uh, have different policies of uh, penalizing those who conduct such misconducts. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you all. And uh, I see Sonia's face, so I will just wrap up that. Uh, well, uh, of course, it's we, we must look at our students, but also it's important that we look at ourselves as a teachers. And uh, from time to time, we reflect uh, on what works, what does not work, and what we can do to encourage our students uh, to study, to do research with integrity, and, and what, how can we help them do that? Okay. So, Sonia, please, you can close now the webinar. Yes. And thank, thank you, you to so all the participants who have been here, and, and we have a lot of comments, and I hope that you will enjoy, and you will use the, the tools as well for your further uh, development. Thank you to all the participants. Thank you for, for this engaging, informative, and really interesting presentation. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot and I hope that our participants learn a lot as well. Uh, so thank you so much and uh, join us tomorrow on our last uh, webinar for this uh, edition of European Academic Integrity Week. Thank you.